Good afternoon, and welcome to our study of the final three chapters of Revelation. We're going to be going through verses, uh, sorry, chapters 20 through 22 today. So uh, we'll start by praying. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you that you are the word made flesh. Thank you, God, that you reveal yourself through your written word. And Father, we just ask as we come to the end of this magnificent uh, revelation uh, that you would speak to our hearts, that you would draw us closer to you, that you would deepen our understanding of you and your kingdom ways, deepen our understanding of our place and our role in your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I'm going to start off by reading the first few verses of chapter 20. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, and threw him into the pit, and locked and sealed it over him, so that he would deceive the nations no more, until the thousand years were ended. After that he must be led out for a little while. Then I saw thrones, and those seated on them were given authority to judge. I also saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their testimony to Jesus and for the word of God. They hadn't worshipped the beast or its image, and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Jesus a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him a thousand years. Chapter 20 probably generates as much if not more discussion than any other in the whole book, because it deals with the millennium or the thousand year reign of Jesus. Generally, Christians fall into one of three camps when it comes to this topic, uh, pre-millennialist, amillennialist or post-millennialist. And very broadly, each school of thought believes as follows, pre-millennialism, uh, is the idea that Jesus will return to earth before the millennium begins to establish a thousand year reign before the final new heaven and new earth is inaugurated. The amillennialist view is that the thousand year kingdom is symbolic only for the present age, that Christ's first coming is seen as the inauguration of his kingdom and his return will be the complete fulfillment of that kingdom. And the post-millennialist view is that uh, Jesus returns after a period of Christian dominance on the earth, which effectively establishes the kingdom over which he will return to reign. The view that you take, and maybe you haven't thought about this before, uh, but the view that you take will probably colour uh, the way you read uh, chapter 20. But I would just say this um, with reference to which, which argument should I, should I follow. Um, it's been attributed to uh, St. Augustine, uh, but I'm not sure if he was the, the original um, founder of this phrase. But it says this, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, in all things, charity. In other words, uh, what I believe is that our view on the millennium and what it actually means is not um, something that we need to get bent out of shape and, and uh, fiercely fight our corner for. Um, the important thing is that wherever we might personally land on the millennium question, for all of us in Christ, Jesus is victorious. And he makes all things new for those who place uh, their trust in him. So, all that being said, 
let's move on to uh, study what the verses say a little more fully. Uh, these first two paragraphs uh, begin with, then I saw. And this section of the, uh, of the book might be, might be understood as an interlude uh, between what was recorded uh, in chapter 19 and the final judgment of all evil, which is recorded um, later on in this particular uh, chapter. Remember, we're familiar with John's use of interludes. There was an interlude between the opening of the sixth and seventh seal. There was an interlude between the, the blast of the, the sixth and the seventh trumpet. So what's going on here seems to fit into that uh, pattern of short intermissions, if you will. The first three verses uh, describe the incarceration of Satan in the abyss for a thousand years. And then verses four through six serve to assure the martyrs that in the divine scheme of things, they have never been forgotten. Remember going back um, into chapter six, we, we had this image of the, the martyrs underneath the altar in the throne room of heaven with this plaintive cry, how long, Lord, how long? Well, we know that that wasn't a, a cry for vengeance. It was a, a cry, a plea from the heart, basically petitioning God and saying, Lord, when will your righteous judgment come to reign for all time in the earth? Now, in chapter nine, Satan emerged from the abyss to inflict harm. But in these short verses, what is shown is that he is being consigned to the abyss while the martyrs are pictured as reigning with Jesus for a thousand years. This is a deliberate reversal uh, of what Satan had previously been allowed to do. The devil, uh, the Satan, uh, the ancient serpent, they're, they're all terms to remind us of the, the primary opponent of God. And because the devil, the Satan, the ancient serpent, as he appeared in, in Genesis, uh, because he's the opponent of God, he is the ultimate enemy of all humankind. Now, the thousand years is specified twice with regard to the binding of Satan and twice to note the time that the resurrected martyrs will reign with Jesus. Verse 3 states that the reason for Satan being bound is that so that he would cease deceiving nations. Now the interpretation of those thousand years, as I alluded to at the beginning of today's session, has consumed Christians throughout the ages. Is it a literal thousand years or is it a figurative term? A couple of points I think we ought to bear in mind. First is this, that John's use of numbers throughout the letter so far have been figurative. We've had very short periods of time uh, specified as uh, a half an hour. Uh, we've had uh, three and a half days. We've had three and a half years. We've had seven years. All of these terms have been figurative terms to uh, describe a finite amount of time. Secondly, um, here as in other parts of his vision, John is very concerned with the place uh, that martyrs hold in the, in the economy of God. The martyrs being those who paid with their lives because of their faithful uh, uh, their faithfulness to the testimony of Jesus. They neither carried the mark of the beast on their foreheads, representing the ideology of evil, nor did they carry uh, the mark on their hands, uh, which is a connotation of their actions following the ideology. And these martyrs are, are portrayed as reigning with Jesus in heaven. And remember the, the initial audience of this uh, revelation 
was those baby churches in Western Turkey, those seven churches. And they were about to have horrible persecution unleashed upon them. And many of them would go to their death because they held true to their faith in Jesus Christ. The third point I would mention is this idea of the binding of Satan. We, we see Jesus refer to that uh, way back in, in Matthew's Gospel and uh, chapter 12 and verses 22 through 29. And the idea of Satan being bound is an interesting one. And it's often puzzled me, but I, I recently heard an, an analogy that I think is helpful. I think most of us are familiar with those uh, uh, TV shows and, and movies where a major crime boss has been incarcerated. And yet from even within the bowels of a prison, he is able to exert his authority on his minions, if you like, in the outside world so that uh, his evil designs are still uh, actualized, though the, the crime boss uh, himself is actually uh, very much incarcerated. I think that's an interesting way to think about Satan being bound. We know he's a defeated enemy. John tells us that he will be bound for a finite period of time before he is released. And I think that's, for me anyway, a helpful uh, way to think about the, the binding of Satan. Also interesting to note, the uh, resurrection occurs after the millennium. So, I want to say a couple more things about this uh, idea of, of binding Satan because I personally hold a, an amillennial view. Um, that is, I believe that when Jesus entered into uh, the world's story, uh, God incarnate, that was the beginning, that was the inauguration of his kingdom. Remember Jesus uh, throughout his ministry uh, announced that the kingdom of God, the kingdom of the heavens was at hand. In other words, he was its representative. So what about binding of Satan? Well, uh, I read this interesting quote from uh, Tim Keller, um, and it's from his book called Making Sense of God. And this is what he says. Demographers tell us the 21st century will be less secular than the 20th. There have been seismic shifts toward Christianity in sub-Saharan Africa and China, while evangelicalism and Pentecostalism have grown exponentially in Latin America. Even in the United States, the growth of those who claim to be non-Christian has been mainly among those who had been more nominal in their relationship to faith. While the devoutly faithful in the United States and Europe are actually growing. Now that was published in 2016. But then fast forward to 2020, just um, three years ago, there was an estimated 2.38 billion, with a B, Christians worldwide. And within that number, Pentecostalism was the fastest growing faith group. Now, why do I make that observation based on Keller's work? That, for me, would indicate that although uh, the work of the enemy is still going on, God's kingdom work is still very much advancing. Okay, so that, that helps me to make sense of the idea of Satan being bound uh, and the sense that he's actually bound in this present time because the millennium was a figurative term that uh, was heralded 
with Jesus uh, entering into the world story and it will end when Jesus returns. Anyway, uh, remember what I said earlier on. I don't believe our view on the millennium is really crucial. It certainly isn't crucial to our faith. What's important to our faith is that we love Jesus and know that he is victorious and we know that the enemy is a defeated enemy. So let's read on. Verses 7 through 15. When the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, in order to gather them for battle. They are as numerous as the sands of the sea. They marched up over the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. And fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Satan's release, um, his final fling, if you will, comes at the end of the uh, millennial period. And here John is using imagery that, that echoes what we read in uh, the book of Ezekiel, specifically chapters 38 and 39. And these two strange names, strange to us anyway, Gog and Magog, uh, are mentioned. And what, what they represent in Revelation are all those who align themselves against God and his people and his kingdom. And what is interesting is that this is all part of the divine plan to destroy every trace of evil for all time. And it's interesting that the, the picture that's painted here, uh, opponents of God's people surround them very ominously, very threateningly, but they gather for a battle which doesn't actually take place because the enemies of God and his people are consumed. They are completely destroyed before they are able to lift a finger in this final battle. And Satan and his followers are consigned um, to a place that's reserved for them. Uh, and if you read Matthew uh, chapter 25 and verse 41, Jesus says something um, which pertains to the, to the passage which we've just read. 2541 says this, um, You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. A couple of points to note. Um, the eternal fire, eternal destruction, second death, which is a term we'll look at a little bit later on in, in our study, is reserved for the devil and his angels. It wasn't intended to be for, for humanity. And we've spoken several times during our study of Revelation that the mercy of God that extends and has extended throughout the ages is quite incredible. God didn't decide to destroy all of those who were against him um, at Calvary. He's given us time, he's given people time to turn toward him and yet there will come a time known only to God when he says, the time has come now. Those in my kingdom will be with me for all eternity. Those who have no desire to be in my kingdom, who have hardened their hearts against me, will endure, will suffer this uh, endless time of torment. And the final judgment is portrayed as the, the least to the greatest standing uh, 
before the Lord. Let's, let's read on the next few verses. Then I saw a great white throne and the one who sat on it. The earth and the heaven fled from his presence and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. And books were opened. Also another book was opened, the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works, as recorded in the books. And the sea gave up their dead that were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And all were judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. The books that John mentions there echo the judgment scene envisioned in uh, Daniel chapter 7 and verse 10. The books represent the uh, evidence, if you will, against those who have rejected the Lord. And it's interesting to me that on, on the day of judgment, um, using uh, earthly uh, court courtroom terminology, on the day of judgment, there will be no room for objection. Uh, God has collected the evidence against those who have rejected him and their sentence, their eternal sentence, will be absolutely just. So they are the books that um, John is referring to. They're, they're books of evidence, if you like, for the prosecution. And there will be no defense and there will be no objection. And contrast those books with the book of life. It's the Lamb's book of life in which is recorded every human being who submits to the Lordship of Jesus. And then death itself, the ultimate enemy of humanity, will be destroyed forever in the lake of fire. Now let's go on to uh, chapter 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. Hmm. Wonderful picture there. They will be his peoples and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. Those who conquer will inherit these things. And I will be their God and they will be my children. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the polluted, the murderers, the fornicators, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and all liars, their place will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. So, after the final judgment and elimination of all evil, John's attention is now fully given to the glorious future for God's people. Now difficult as it might be uh, for us to imagine, there is a clear path now to an existence in which every single trace of thought, word and deed, every single trace of evil in thought, word and deed 
has been eradicated for all eternity with God dwelling with his people. God dwelling with his people is a, is a theme that has uh, run throughout uh, the Old Testament. Uh, if you refer to Leviticus chapter 26, verses 11 and 12, uh, Zechariah chapter 2, verses 10 through 12, uh, Ezekiel, uh, chapter 37 verses 27 through 28 they are three of many examples of God's expressed desire to dwell with his people and the picture that John is portraying here is of God's kingdom of heaven being made fully manifest here on earth in a perfectly ordered world it's interesting that he mentions that the sea would be no more. Um, of course, to the ancients, as we've mentioned previously, the sea represented chaos and danger and uncertainty. Now again, our imaginations are stretched because we don't live in an ordered world. We certainly don't live in a perfectly ordered world as, as try as we might to, to make our own personal worlds ordered. We live in a disordered world. Um, we live in a dysfunctional world. But that is going to come to an end in this beautiful image uh, that John is portraying for us. And the, 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 the list of people at the end, starting with the cowardly and ending up with uh, the liars and everything in between, is basically John's way of saying that there will be no place for those who reject the Lord. When he finally uh, comes again in glory to dwell for all time with humanity, uh, for those who have submitted to his Lordship, uh, there will be no place for those who have rejected him. Quite simply put, they have no desire to live in his presence. And so they won't. Let's read on. Verses 9 through 21. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me, Come and I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And in the spirit he carried me to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It has the glory of God and a radiance like a very rare jewel, like jasper, clear as crystal. It has a great high wall with twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and on the gates are inscribed the names of the twelve tribes of the Israelites. On the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the wall of the city has twelve foundations, and on them are the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. The angel who talked to me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and walls. The city lies four square. Its length is the same as its width, and he measured the city with his rod 1,500 miles. Its length and width and height are equal, in other words, a cube. He also measured its wall 144 cubits by human measurement, which, which the angel was using. The wall is built of jasper, while the city is pure gold, clear as glass. The foundations of the wall of the city are adorned with every jewel. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth amethyst. And the twelve gates are twelve pearls. Each of the gates is a single pearl, and the street of the city is pure gold, transparent as glass. I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God is its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. People will bring into it the glory and honour of the nations, but nothing unclean will enter it, 
nor will anyone who practices abomination or falsehood, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. So John is shown a new Jerusalem, which appears to be the very centerpiece, the epicenter, if you will, of the new heaven and new earth. And in a way that only apocalyptic literature can, uh, the holy city uh, is both a people and a place. Um, God's people are described uh, as, a, as a bride in, in other places. So we must understand that, that some of these terms are uh, very much interchangeable. So let's, let's see what else is going on here. Built into the fabric of the city are the names of the 12 tribes of Israel and the names of the 12 apostles. Um, now that is a representation of both old and new covenants. Uh, 12 tribes of Israel representing those, those people um, who came in the Old Testament, if you will, uh, prior to the, the, the entry of Jesus into the human story, the old covenant and the new covenant, obviously um, represented by the 12 apostles who came during and after the time of Jesus. Note that the city is made of incredible jewels, uh, not bricks and mortar. <laughs> uh, and we have these astonishing references um, to things that, that we have no real experience of. Um, the gold is clear as glass. Um, so we're, we're to imagine something, if you will, that is almost outside of our uh, sphere of experience. It's going to be so incredibly otherworldly, if you will. Now the measurements of the city and the measuring of the city is very significant. Um, again, not for the first time, uh, John echoes things that we read in the, in the Old Testament, specifically in this case, Ezekiel chapter 40, where there's the, the detailed measuring of the temple that, that takes place. Now, the, the actual dimensions um, of the measuring that takes place in Revelation, you will have noted 1,500 times 1,500 times 1,500 miles presents an incredibly gigantic cube. And again, uh, I don't think we're meant to necessarily take the, the 1500 miles measurement literally, but I think we are uh, meant to be attentive to the fact that this is a cube and it's the shape of the Holy of Holies, which is described in detail in 1 Kings uh, chapter six. Remember, the Holy of Holies was the, the inner sanctum of the, of, of the temple. This was the, the closest place uh, that God came to his people. It was that place which only once a year the high priest uh, entered into. And he did that in fear and trepidation because he was entering into the presence of God on behalf of God's people. But now, in this restored creation, uh, in God's ultimately fulfilled plan, uh, there's no need for a temple. There's no need for a holy of holies because God himself has come to be with his people. And if you're interested in the... Um, the jewels that are specified uh, with regard to describing the foundations of the New Jerusalem. Uh, these jewels are actually um, the ones that we read about in the description of the breastplate of the high priest. You can, you can read about that in Exodus uh, 
28 and verses 17 through 20. The temple in Jerusalem, we must remember, was only ever a signpost to a reality that we have described in Habakkuk uh, chapter 2 and verse 14, where he says, The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And what this picture of Revelation is telling us is the time will come when this prophetic word becomes a reality. God won't be accessed through temple worship. God won't be accessed through entering into the Holy of Holies. God will be in our midst. That is the reality that all those who are in Christ will be a part of. John tells us that even the sun and the moon will become redundant, if you will. It's almost as if they themselves were merely signposts to God's glorious future um, and this incredible light that comes from living in his presence. In fact, you might say the, the good creation described in Genesis 1 and 2 was itself a signpost to this glorious future that, that uh, John is now describing. And I think it's good for us to remember that God does not abolish creation. He doesn't regard this as a plan A that failed, so he'll ball it up and throw it into some cosmic waste uh, basket and start all over again. This restoration of the new heaven and the new earth is according entirely to God's always intended plan. Okay, so we mustn't think that Revelation 21 and 22 represents uh, God's better effort after a failed attempt. It's not that at all. It's God's perfection being outworked. The text describes the glory and honour of the nations being brought through the city's open gates, which is an echo of Isaiah chapter 60 and verses 11 and 12. And that stands in sharp contrast to the, the nations which gathered against the Lord's people. Uh, just a few verses ago in Revelation uh, chapter 20. Now we have an entirely different picture. The nations of the world, those, those nations who have given themselves to the Lord, the people who've given themselves to the Lord, bring everything they can to, to glorify and honour him. And the idea of there being uh, open gates in the city um, represents the fact that there will be no night. Um, we know that in the ancient world, um, city gates were closed at night to uh, repel would-be attackers. But in the image that John is sharing with us now of this beautiful, almost hard to imagine city, the gates will be constantly open for a free flow of traffic because there will be no one who is uh, an enemy of God present. And again, not, not for the first time, John talks um, about people who will not be there. Nothing unclean will enter the city nor anyone who practices, practices abomination or falsehood. It's, it's John's way of re-emphasizing, if you will, that evil has been completely eradicated. That everyone in God's new, uh, restored heaven and earth will be there because they have a, a desire to live in the presence of God. And for those who don't have that desire, as we mentioned earlier on, they won't be in the presence of God. They'll spend eternity in a very, very different, almost too horrible to imagine environment. So let's, let's go on to uh, our final chapter. We'll read the first seven verses first. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. 
On either side of the river is the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit, producing its fruit each month. And the leaves of the trees are for the healing of the nations. Nothing accursed will be found there any more, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads, and there will be no more night. They need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign for ever and ever. And he said to me, These words are trustworthy and true, for the Lord, the God of the Spirit of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. See, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. I love the way Revelation um, actually serves to to knit the entirety of the uh, the message of the Bible right from Genesis um, through to this glorious conclusion. And you may remember that in Genesis chapter two and verses ten through fourteen, there is one river flowing from Eden, and it divides into four glorious life-giving waterways. And then in Ezekiel chapter 47 verses 1 through 12, there is this wonderful description of a life-giving river flowing from the temple. So life-giving is it that, that it turns brackish and salt water and stagnant water into fresh water. And this theme of life-giving water is taken up now in, in uh, John's revelation. And in a form in which he beautifully reworks Old Testament imagery. Um, This river, um, the rivers of the creation story, the the rivers, um, the river recorded in Ezekiel, and of course Jesus' own testimony that he was the, the, the river of life, the water of life, they're now brought to this beautiful perfection. And this is a river, the river that John is talking about now, this is a river along which the tree of life grows. If you remember, the the tree of life was the the very one that Adam and Eve in the creation story were not allowed to taste. In fact, God exiled them from the garden at the point at which um, they were probably going to uh, engage in eating that fruit. I'll just refer back to it for you. It says this, Then the Lord said, See, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, because they'd eaten of the fruit of that tree. And now he might reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. That tree that was not accessible uh, to Adam and Eve is now lining the river of life. It's a beautiful image and and what it says about this, this tree, these trees, is that the leaves of this tree The leaves of these trees are for the healing of the nations. And you may wonder what that means, because surely in the new heaven and new earth, uh, there will be no enmity between uh, nations. And you're absolutely right. This is speaking of the perfect harmony that will exist between God's people and God himself in the new heaven and the new earth. Those things that have served to separate us literally over multiple millennia will be no more. Uh, Everything will be restored uh, and placed in God's perfect order. And the angel tells John this will take place soon. (laughs) And when we read that word, we, we... We shouldn't be so much looking at our watches or at our our calendars or or our personal schedules. We we should realize that this is 
the angel's way of saying this will happen suddenly. Remember the imagery we've talked about multiple times before, the image that Jesus himself portrayed about his coming again in glory like a thief in the night. It's the suddenness of Jesus' return which will take people by surprise. So those of us that are in him should live literally each day as though this could be the day of Jesus' return. Let's read the final several verses, beginning at 8. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your comrades, the prophets, and with those who keep the word of this book. Worship God. And he said to me, do you not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Let the evildoers still do evil, and the filthy still be filthy, and the righteous still do right, and the holy still be holy. See, I am coming soon. My reward is with me to repay according to everyone's work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they will have the right to the tree of life and may enter the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the fornicators and murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. It is I, Jesus, who sent my angel to you with this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come, and let everyone who hears say, come, and let everyone who is thirsty come. Let anyone who wishes to take the water of life as a gift. I warn everyone who hears the words of this prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to that person the plagues described in this book. If anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away that person's share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. The one who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with all the saints. Amen. Not for the first time, John tries to fall down in worship at the feet of an angel. And again, the angel corrects him and he says, no, no, no. We together only worship one. And it is God. And when he says, do not seal up the words of this prophecy, I think it's by way of saying, make this known. Let the world know that Jesus will return and he will gather his people. And there is an opportunity for people to turn to Christ. But that timeline of opportunity is finite. It's known only to God. So each and every day should be seen as a matter of urgency in terms of our uh, doing the work of God's kingdom. Again, John in verse 15 talks about a group of people uh, who will not be part of God's kingdom. Now he terms them Dogs, sorcerers, fornicators, murderers, and idolaters, and those who love and practice falsehood. And you may say, well, are they going to be outside the city or are they going to be in a lake of fire? Is John being inconsistent here? No, he's not at all. We must remember this is apocalyptic literature. The use of imagery is strong throughout this letter. What John is going to great pains, if you will, to point out is that there will be those who spend eternity away from the presence of God. And that is a life that he has described, if you can call it a life, as a second death. Eternal death 
is what John is talking about here. And he's basically making the point that there will be a clear demarcation. There will be people who dwell in the kingdom of heaven for all eternity, in the very real presence of God for all eternity. And there will be those who dwell as a second death, an eternal death, away from the presence of all that is good and lovely and holy and light. And that's why I think we should be regarding with a sense of urgency our prayers for, for our, our loved ones, our neighbours and those who don't have a relationship with the Lord or don't seem to have a relationship with the Lord. May our prayer be that the Lord would continue to relentlessly pursue them and bring them to that place of knowing that they too can have a share in God's eternal kingdom. But the alternative to that is not an ambivalent, well, I'll spend eternity sitting on the fence with my feet in both camps, as it were. That's not what Revelation is telling us. That's not what Scripture tells us. The reality is those who are not in God's kingdom will spend eternity in a very, very different environment. They'll spend eternity in hell. And then this beautiful invitation at the end from Jesus himself. He says, all who are thirsty, come to me, the river of life, while there is still time. It's not that uh, the Lord is trying to be resistant to welcoming others into the kingdom. That's his heart's desire. But... (laughs) There is a time limit on when that is going to happen. You see, that time is now. And at a time known only to God, Jesus will return suddenly. So for you and me, we're invited to be zealous in our love of God, to be courageous in the ways in which we proclaim the the gospel, And to ask God to continue to inspire us that we might reflect, even though it will be an imperfect reflection, that we would reflect the glory of God's perfected creation. And that we would do that however and wherever he's calling us, wherever he's placed us. Gordon Fee says this, the future for God's children is rich and beyond anything human beings have experienced to this point in time. I hope that as we've gone through Revelation, we will be inspired to keep on reading it and rereading it and making the the Old Testament uh, and New Testament uh, links and references But over and above everything else, I I pray that we will be excited about this wonderful eternal future that we have, but also challenged to express something of the kingdom of God in our day-to-day lives now, in our homes, in our extended families, in our neighborhoods, and in our places of work. May it be so, Lord, in Jesus' name.